Proponents of the Gaia theory suggest that these new viruses have been created by Earth in self-defense. It's a theory that's gaining wider acceptance, and now it appears that Mother Nature is fighting back at us with more than just viruses. I think the problem is much more serious than we hear in the media uh, because the story is still breaking. Everyone is involved. This is not one person's problem. This is everyone's problem. The Gaia theory, first espoused by James Lovelock, suggests that Earth is a living entity capable of fighting off infection. In our last report, we brought disturbing evidence that the infection is us. By cutting away and, and disrupting the balance, you have, in effect, Gaia's revenge. The ecosystem fights back and it attacks the people. It, 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 it harms them with disease and drives them out. According to Gaia theorists, Mother Earth's number one enemy is overpopulation. We are the threat. We are the problem. There are five billion of us on the planet. There is a quarter of a trillion pounds of human flesh on this planet. And the flesh is weak. We are pouring billions of tons of garbage and chemicals into Gaia. Her immune system is badly deteriorating. Participants at a recent World Wildlife Symposium warned Gaia is struggling just to maintain the status quo. Some of us were seeing that animals were getting sick and dying. Others were seeing that there are definite developmental effects, that birds had twisted beaks, that uh, animals were developing tumors all over them. Each and every year, 435 billion pounds of man-made chemicals are released into our world's ever-weakening environment. Recent studies suggest that these chemicals are disrupting hormone production, impairing the reproductive cycle of many animals. And we are one of those animals. According to one study, male sperm counts have dropped 40% since World War II. The trend is unequivocal that male sperm counts have been dropping. And that could be the underlying explanation for the increase in infertility in men, but that will not explain why they're dropping. And that's the big question, what's going on out there? This is what's going on out there, according to Gaia theorists. Since Gaia cannot absorb everything we feed into it, Gaia must attack the source. It's us against the world. The first warning signals that this is the new reality are occurring here in the befouled waters of Lake Apopka in Florida. Wildlife biologist Tim Gross discovered that many alligators, turtles, and fish in the lake are neither male nor female. Their sexual development is mutating. The effects that we're seeing that are quite dramatic are effects on the developing embryo. So in other words, these concentrations are deposited in the eggs during the development of the egg in mom, they're quite toxic to an embryo, and they form major alterations in the sexual differentiation. There are signs that these kinds of genetic disturbances are on the increase throughout the United States. Biologists are beginning to see what they refer to as gender warping occurring in a wide variety of animal species. Is this yet another weapon of Gaia's revenge? If males are not male, and females are not female, they cannot reproduce and are therefore only one generation away from extinction. How far then are we from the same fate? I think those people who say that the effects on wildlife are isolated events and will have no effect on humans are being uh, overly reassuring. Hormones are basically ubiquitous. In other words, they're shared by all animal species in that the hormones that control reproduction in alligators and turtles also control reproduction in humans. That is rather devastating because it can create major fertility problems in the human population. This affects all of us because some of these contaminants are present in all of our food and in our drinking water. A chemical present in our food and in our water can have potentially disrupting effects on a fetus, on any of us as adults. Through pollution, we could be very well ensuring our own extinction. But studies, some sponsored by chemical companies, conclude that the Earth and its inhabitants are resilient and will not suffer long-term effects. Infertility expert Dr. Michael Zinman is not convinced. Exposing a pregnant woman to a variety of so-called benign, no-problem chemicals have turned out to not be so benign and cause long-term effects in their offspring and affected their offspring's ability to have offspring. By polluting Gaia, have we sealed our own fate? Has Earth become so riddled with the cancer of chemical waste that there's no cure in sight? 
A large number of the public will believe this data, will take it to heart very seriously, and be a very concern. Their biggest question then immediately after that is, okay, there's a problem, how do I clean it up? That's where it's, it's depressing because I don't know how to clean it up. I don't know of any research indicating how we clean it up. Our cleanup methods currently are sort of bury it or hide it or just let it go for a long time and hopefully it'll decay and disappear. The problem is the average person on the street is not well enough informed to get worried about it. If people could become educated about the potential threats to their health and that of their family and children, then that's probably a way to get them more involved. It's been more than 20 years since he first introduced his groundbreaking Gaia hypothesis. Today, inventor scientist James Lovelock and his wife Sandy live and work on a 35-acre estate in the Cornish Highlands, which he's preserving as a wildlife habitat. How did you come up with the Gaia theory? Well, I, I was very fortunate in 1961. I got a letter from the director of space flight operations of NASA. They wanted to use my gadgets, these sensitive devices, for analyzing the lunar soil to see if it would be safe for astronauts to go there. But it wasn't long before I f became interested in the next big step, which was to go to Mars. And, uh, and the question, how do you find if there's life there? Lovelock determined that Mars was almost certainly lifeless because its atmospheric composition was static in contrast to Earth's composite parts, which are highly volatile. So I then thought, well, if it's an atmosphere like that, highly unstable, something must be keeping it constant because it couldn't stay constant on its own. And that set me thinking about a regulating system at the Earth's surface, which presumably was life itself. And then this, this idea of Gaia was born in my mind. Since then, Lovelock's Gaia theory has been embraced and embellished on by scientists, environmentalists, and New Age philosophers who believe Gaia is a sentient being with a capacity for intelligence, emotion, even vengeance. I don't really now regard the Earth as a living organism. I think in the early days of Gaia, we used the term the Earth is alive metaphorically. What we meant was that the Earth has properties like those of a living organism. It's able to regulate its temperature, and it's able to regulate its chemistry. And that was all we meant by it. The father of the Gaia theory is deeply concerned by humankind's apparent disregard for the delicate balance between our planet and her life-sustaining atmosphere. What is the greatest danger to us right now? If you're talking about human dangers, so we're now talking in terms of hundreds of years, not millions or billions, there's a distinct possibility that a large chunk of ice which is supported above the water by a ridge in Antarctica, it's called the West Antarctic Ice Sheet, may slip off into the ocean. It did so 120,000 years ago during another interglacial. And if we go on warming the Earth up by adding CO2 and things, it may well slip off again. When it does, it's estimated there will be a maximum rise of sea level of about 15 feet. But even if only a part of it drops off, and there's only a rise of five feet of sea level, this will be enough to take out many of the major cities around the world. London would certainly go. New York would be gravely under threat. Um, Houston would probably go. Miami. All sorts of cities. Is there anything that we can do to slow that process, or is it inevitable? I honestly don't think there's much we can do to slow it. I think it would be too difficult to get all of the nations of the world together to say we're going to stop burning fossil fuels. And we'll just have to hope that uh, the cooling off towards the next ice age offsets the global warming due to the CO2 increase. But it's not a very hopeful thought. But Lovelock does find hope in the fact that the average person's environmental awareness is much greater now than it was when he first proposed the Gaia theory nearly 25 years ago. I've always found that the man and woman in the street understand Gaia far better than my colleagues do. Uh, the rules are quite simple. If you live well with the environment and improve it, you improve the chances for your progeny. And that means, according to Darwin, your species will survive and, and flourish. But if you do things that are bad for the environment, your species is doomed. 